I thank the Prime Minister. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? I call the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. And I refer her to Treasury modelling that shows that the carbon tax will cause a $32 billion hit to the Australian economy and a $600 a year cut in real wages by 2020. And I ask, why did the Prime Minister break the promise she made to the Australian people at the last election, namely, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In answer to the Leader of the Opposition's question, it is clear that he means to go on, as he did in 2011, <laughs> with misleading claims and continued negativity as we ready our economy for the future, including for a clean energy future. Mr Speaker, the figures referred to in the Leader of the Opposition's question are another attempt by the Opposition to mislead the Australian people. Treasury modelling shows, and the opposition is aware of this, that under a carbon price our economy will continue to grow. Jobs will grow, with employment expected to increase by 1.6 million jobs by 2020. Real wages will grow by 20 per cent by 2020 and 50 per cent by 2050. Incomes will grow. Gross national income per person will be 9 per cent higher in today's dollars in 2020 with a carbon price in place. Vitally, carbon pollution will fall. By 2050, carbon pricing is expected to reduce Australia's domestic emissions by nearly half of what they would have been projected to be without a carbon price. The price impacts will be modest, a one-off increase of 0.7 per cent in CPI. And, of course, we also know that the carbon pricing package comes with the benefit of tax cuts for working people, for working people earning less than $80,000 a year, uh, many of them receiving a tax cut of $300. And then, of course, there will be Australians around the nation who no longer pay tax anymore as a result of us increasing the tax-free threshold, and there will be increases in pensions, and there will be increases in family payments. Now, behind this debate, Mr Speaker, is the essential question of whether or not you want our nation to stand still or be ready for the future. It is a fundamental choice. Well, we have made it. We are getting our, ready, our nation ready for the future, and that future will require us to have a cleaner energy economy. And in getting that cleaner energy economy, we are determined to do it at the lowest possible cost and the lowest possible price. The Leader of the Opposition stands for a policy which would impose a burden of $1,300 on working families, a policy that will not work, and he stands for ripping tax cuts, family payment increases and uh, uh, pension increases out of the hands of Australians who Jones. need that money. This is more of the reckless approach we have seen the opposition take to all of its economic settings. Whenever it faces a choice between getting ready for the future or standing still, it says stand still. Whenever it faces a choice about running the economy in the interests of working Australians, it says let's help the privileged few. Whenever it faces a choice about making sure our economy is clean and ready for the future, it spreads fear and distortion, and today's question is just more of that. Uh, I, the Leader of the Opposition on a supplementary question. To, to the Prime Minister, a very simple question. Does she accept that the imposition of a carbon tax will reduce economic growth? as the Treasury modelling clearly shows. Prime Minister. Uh, I accept, Mr Speaker, that the Treasury modelling which I have just relied on and the figures that I have given to the House are the Treasury modelling and should be relied on. I also accept, Mr Speaker, that the carbon pricing package of the government, the carbon pricing package of the government is the cheapest possible way of reducing silent. our carbon pollution. 
So when you want to talk about a drag on our economy, when you want to talk about a burden on working families, then you would endorse the policy of the Leader of the Opposition. Let's have a look at the policy of the Leader of the Opposition, seeing he invites the comparison. And if he wants to get it modelled, if he actually wants to tell Australians the truth about it, we will happily assist. But what we know is because the Leader of the Opposition is in the business of subsidising polluters, then he would make a carbon pollution uh, reductions at a far greater cost than carbon pricing. That is, he would do the most economically reckless thing, a thing that would certainly have a huge impact on economic growth and a huge uh, impact on jobs. The Prime Minister will resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business. On direct speak. relevance, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister was asked a very direct question about the Treasury modelling. She wasn't asked about the Leader of the Opposition's position. I would counsel the Prime Minister to directly be relevant to the supplementary question. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I would say on comparisons of economic effects of carbon pricing packages, we are determined to do it in the most efficient way. That's what the Treasury modelling shows. It shows economic growth. It shows income growth. It shows our economy growing. What the Leader of the Opposition is determined to do is do the most costly approach, wrecking economic growth with an impact for jobs and taking benefits off working families. I now give the call to the honourable member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Could the Prime Minister please update the House on the latest information from the floods in Queensland and also the floods in New South Wales? Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Oxley for his question. And of course, uh, his region suffered flooding uh, last year, and I've had the opportunity to attend with him uh, and also with the member for Blair some commemorative events uh, marking the suffering and loss that we saw last summer. Uh, Mr Speaker, unfortunately it is a sombre ritual that whenever this parliament comes back together at the start of a year, we have something to reflect on that has harmed our nation in the time in between. Three years ago we came together and of course this House was devastated by the Victorian bushfires and we felt the pain of Victorians and the pain of Australians in those dramatic and destructive events. And then last year we paused to reflect on all that we had lost in the summer of natural disasters as it had hit so hard into Queensland and in other parts of the nation, including Victoria. And coming back to the parliament today, we actually meet at a time where in Queensland and northern New South Wales, people are struggling with flood waters and uh, are seeing those flood waters rising with all of the implications that that's got for their communities. I spoke last night to Senator Barnaby Joyce about circumstances in St George, a very beloved place for him. Uh, I have visited St George myself. I visited last time uh, during the flooding. For many of the families there, this is the third time that they have faced flooding. Uh, last year, when I visited there, I met people who were worried about flooding then, who had only just got their homes back together following the earlier flood. And now, of course, those same individuals are seeing flood waters threaten. Uh, so we know that right around uh, those parts of Queensland and into northern New South Wales, there are people who are doing it very tough indeed, and our thoughts are with them. Uh, Mr Speaker, in these circumstances, we've made available the resources of the ADF. They did such remarkable work last summer, and some of those resources have been deployed again, including fixed-wing aircraft and helicopters. And I think people would be well aware of the work that uh, both can do in times of natural disaster and some of the very dramatic, indeed heroic, things that helicopter crews did last summer. Uh, we have been asked by Premier Bly in respect of Queensland and Premier O'Farrell in respect of New South Wales to join with them under our natural disaster arrangements in making available Category C assistance. That means that there will be assistance for small businesses and primary producers. And the triggering of that Category C assistance also means that for those areas we have triggered the Australian Government Disaster Relief Payment 
which is an emergency payment of $1,000 per adult and $400 per child. Uh, now, these have been triggered in various shires in Queensland and New South Wales. So, for anyone who is interested in very specific information about their own circumstances, I would advise them to ring 180 to get help and advice. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure, as we sit this week, uh, we will be thinking about our fellow Australians who are in those circumstances, some in evacuation centres, some very anxious indeed, and our thoughts will be with them. I, on indulgence, the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Mr Speaker, on indulgence, uh, may I uh, note uh, what the Prime Minister has said is being done by the government, and may I express the thought that, uh, as well as Senator Joyce, this will be of great interest uh, to the member for Maranoa uh, and also uh, to the member for Parks. Uh, when I spoke to the member for Maranoa last Friday, uh, he was uh, helping his community to prepare sandbags in Roma. Uh, when I spoke to the member for Parks uh, last Friday, he was readying his truck uh, and his bobcat to help with the clean-up. Uh, it's good that the government uh, is institutionally uh, coming to help these people, uh, as local members uh, have been doing on the ground over the last few days. I now call the honourable member for Menzies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to her breach of the written contract she made with the member for Denison to introduce mandatory pre-commitments for poker machines by May of this year. And I ask, will the Prime Minister? And I ask. And I ask, will the Prime Minister guarantee that she won't break any more promises this year? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And in answer to the member's Order. question, Order. let me we'll say this. Prime we will bring silence. to the, the Parliament the, the biggest package of changes for problem gambling ever enacted by a national government or national parliament in our nation's history. And I would also say, in respect of the member's question, uh, that yes, of course, the government looked to bring mandatory pre-commitment legislation to the parliament, and it was apparent to me that that legislation would not pass the parliament. Uh, the Prime because Minister will resume her seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister was asked a very straightforward question as to whether she will promise not to break any more promises in 2012. If she can't make that promise, she should resume her seat. The Manager of Opposition Business would have listened to the question as I did, and the question included a reference to a mandatory pre-commitment uh, and problem gambling. The Prime Minister is addressing the question, and I'm sure that she will address all of the question uh, during the period that she has. Speaker, the Prime Minister I has would the have call. thought that every member in this parliament would think problem gambling is a serious issue worthy of consideration and the bringing to that consideration of a serious demeanour given the number of Australians who actually suffer, sometimes with the cost of their lives through suicide, as a result of problem gambling. Mr Speaker, we will bring to this parliament the biggest package of change a national government has ever done in relation to problem gambling. Yes, of course, the government worked with Mr Wilkie on mandatory pre-commitment, and it became apparent that such legislation would not have got through this chamber, in part because the opposition would not vote for it. So it seems to me quite remarkable indeed that any member of the opposition who would have come in here and voted against such legislation now member comes into court. the parliament to raise the issue of that legislation. The opposition was opposed to it. We will bring to this parliament changes that can secure parliamentary support. Because, Mr Speaker, when faced with a choice of doing nothing or getting something done that will matter to families around the nation, well, I'm for getting something done. And what we will get done will make a practical difference in the lives of Australians who struggle with problem gambling. Now, I know, due to its re relentless negativity, due to the leadership of the Leader of the Opposition, that the demeanour of the Opposition on any proposition for change is to say no. 
They don't want our nation ready for the future. They don't want working families to get a package of policies that benefit them. They don't want to support jobs. They don't want to build the new economy of the future. And they certainly didn't want to do anything to support uh, Australians in need as a result of problem gambling. I think the test that will face the opposition is when we do bring this legislation to the parliament, where will they vote? What will they do, or will we see the same kind of hypocrisy on display then that we are seeing on display now? I, <coughs> I call uh, the honourable member for Parramatta. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is the government building the Australian economy of the future and governing in the interests of working people? I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, and I thank the member for Parramatta for her question. Mr Speaker, the single biggest debate that we will have in this parliament over this 12 months will be about the economy. It is a debate that requires you to make some fundamental choices, a debate that requires you to define who you stand for, who you stand with and who you seek to benefit. We as a government have made our choices. We are determined to stand up for the interests of working people. We are determined to add to the package of policies we have already enacted to support working families. Of course, those policies include uh, the paid parental leave scheme that the government has brought into existence. They include putting more money into supporting families with the costs of childcare than ever before. They include our focus on early childhood education and schools and, of course, making sure that people can get better health care services. They include the tax cuts that we have delivered so far. They include the changes that we have made in various payments, including through the pension, to support families at all stages of life, whether it be from the birth of a new child to when uh, mum or dad or grandmum or granddad requires the assistance of the pension. This year we will add to that package of policy some new family payments arrangements for families with teenagers, tax cuts pension increases, family payment increases and expanded education tax rebate. Uh, until this government enacted it, there was not assistance with the cost of getting kids to school. Now we will broaden that assistance. At the same time, we will, we will be acting to build the new economy of the future. We delivered the foundation stones last year, and it wasn't easy, Mr Speaker, but it has been done. So we will seize a clean energy future. We will get working people a fair share of the resources boom underway in our nation. We will understand the changes happening in the global economy in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and as we see spectacular growth in our region. And we will seize those opportunities for Australia's future. I want us to come out a winner in this time of change in the global economy and in our region. We will deliver a new skills package. We will build on our education reforms because the economy of the future will require higher and higher and higher levels of skill. We will continue to roll out the national broadband network because yesterday's infrastructure is not good enough to build the, the new economy. And we will Sydney ensure will that it is a silent. diversified economy, one where mining is not the only source of strength where we still have a manufacturing industry, where we still have people making cars in this country, where we still have a vibrant tourism industry, where we have a vibrant services sector. That is the debate of this year. It is about the employment of Australians. It's about their ability to get a job. It's about their ability to do that today and in the economy we will build for the future. On the other side of politics, we understand that in this debate, Therefore, standing still. Therefore, the privileged interests of a few, rather than the many working families who need to benefit from our resources, boom. Therefore, not moving to a clean energy future in any way that makes sense. Therefore, ripping the national the broadband network out Riverina of the ground. Therefore, education silent. cuts in schools and to apprenticeships and beyond. Mr Speaker, this is the debate of 2012, and I'm very happy to say to the leader of the opposition, bring it on. I um, now give the call to the honourable member for Sturt, manager of opposition business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
I refer the Prime Minister to the Fair Work inquiry into the Health Services Union that is now in its fourth year, longer than the Watergate inquiry, longer than the Korean War, longer than it took to build Sydney's Olympic Stadium and longer than the duration even of the Rudd government, leading some to believe that there is an institutional go slow to protect her government. As the government relies on the member for Dobell to stay in office, can the Prime Minister Order confirm the that she still has full confidence will remain, in the member for Dobell? Will, 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 will resume his seat, the Leader of the House, on a point of order? Y yes, Mr. Question. Yes, Mr. Question. Standing well, order. order. I, I, I am trying to listen to the point of order being taken. The Leader of the House uh, on a point of order. Nixon. Um, standing Order 100 provides for very clear uh, no argument. That, that uh, question was clearly out of standing, out of order, and should be ruled out of order, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the member for Sturt is not helping the chair. If he doesn't want to be candidate one for the sin bin, he will be a little quieter. There is no doubt that that question was skating very close to the line. Uh, however, I rule it in order and I call upon the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And the answer to the member's question is yes. And I would also make the observation to the member uh, that uh, sometimes the opposition says that it wants to criticise the government because it says it's interfered in the Fair Work Australia investigation. Obviously, those allegations are untrue. But sometimes the opposition decides to criticise on that basis. And then today they walk into this parliament and say, get right in there and interfere and hurry Fair Work Australia up. Well, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Independent is independent and Fair Work Australia is independent. The real motivation behind this question, Mr Speaker, I think is clear for all to see. The Liberal Party, the National Party, the current leader of the opposition have always hated the industrial umpire because they've always hated fairness for working people, and it's more of the same. I now call the honourable member for Melbourne. My question is to the Prime Minister. Last year's budget paper stated, and I quote, in line with the government's agreement with the Australian Greens, the government has committed that significant reforms to dental health will be a priority for the 2012 budget. Prime Minister, given that Australia is a wealthy country, yet an estimated 500,000 people are on dental waiting lists, will the government stand by this commitment to the Greens as a first step towards bringing dental care into Medicare? I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Melbourne for his question. And can I say to the member for Melbourne, I do share his concerns about the circumstances of, of Australians who find dental care beyond their reach. I think all of us in this chamber know, uh, just from practical real-world experience, how expensive it can be to go to the dentist. And we know that there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who find themselves unable to meet the cost. Uh, with all of the uh, pain that that can cause for them, with all of the degeneration of their teeth that that can cause, and the medical evidence does show that if you do have uh, chronic problems with your teeth, that that can affect the rest of your body and your health care in general. So I do share the member's concern. And because we have, as a Labor Party, had a long-standing concern in this area, of course we campaigned against the closure of the Commonwealth Dental Program by the Howard government. We thought that was the wrong thing to do then. It's still wrong today uh, to make those kind of choices and those kind of cutbacks, which the Leader of the Opposition, when he was Minister for Health, was famous for. We have taken an approach of building capacity in dentistry, both by providing new capital and by providing new investments in workforce. And I would uh, remind the House that we've delivered uh, practical improvements like subsidising around 1.5 million dental checkups for teenagers. We've provided $125 million for eight dental projects from the Health and Hospital Fund, delivering 220 new dental chairs. 
We have recently opened a $2.1 million ten-chair teaching dental clinic at the Adelaide Dental Hospital, and that will mean an extra 52,500 hours of clinical training over the next five years for undergraduate dental and oral health students. And we will invest $52.6 million over four years to support the dental workforce of the future through a voluntary dental intern program. Now, I believe that the member who asked the question would understand the constraints in the provision of dentistry, uh, not only the resources in the system, it is the workforce, which is why these workforce investments are so important. Of course, uh, to the member for Melbourne and to you, Mr Speaker, I would want to see us do more. But as we weigh what we can do in the budget process, we will, of course, make the appropriate fiscal decisions Order. for the nation. Left. Now, we'll I understand that that has caused those opposite who have got a $70 billion plan to cut services off working families uh, to roll their eyes because they have never understood what it is like to do the hard work to get a budget to add up. And of course, where they are is $70 billion coming out of working families and the services they need. So we will uh, keep uh, working, Mr Speaker, uh, on proposals for dental care. And in that regard, I believe, as the member for Melbourne would know, uh, we have uh, commissioned an expert body uh, to provide us with advice, and we have received that report. Uh, that was the National Advisory Council on Dental Health that we established. We are waiting for it to present its final report. Uh, they have been working and we have received uh, some advice from them, but obviously we want the final report for government. Uh, so to the member for Melbourne, I would conclude by saying we are certainly concerned about this problem. We have demonstrated that concern not only through our campaigning against the cuts of previous governments, but practical action during the life of this government, and we will continue to take that kind of approach. When members are quiet, I will give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, the, Mr Speaker. I've got uh, the call. Well, the Deputy Leader would assist the Chair if she would resume her seat. Uh, the, the Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, the member for Karangamite was on his feet, was on his feet, and in terms of the process of the parliamentary question order, as those opposite know, it goes we have had now two opposition members in a row in terms of two on that side two on that side of the, the chamber the leader, it is now according to House, standing orders appropriate the, that a call the, firstly the deputy leader of the opposition will resume her seat uh, as will the member for Karangamite. i'm listening to the leader of the house thank, thank you mr most speaker intently. in accordance with standing orders which require the call to be given alternately to either side of the house the member for Karangamite was, in fact, on his feet. Well, yes, I, the member for Karangamite will resume his seat. I did not see the member for Karangamite. Maybe I should apologise to him for not having seen him, but I did see the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, and she has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Here, here, here. I refer the Foreign Minister to the statement by the Canadian Foreign Minister, Canada having rejected a carbon tax, that carbon trading was like a giant pyramid marketing scheme. Can the Foreign Minister name any other countries imposing a carbon tax comparable to that proposed for Australia? The Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question, because uh, this side of the House stands for putting a price on carbon. Those on that side of the House stand for putting their head in the sands and ignoring their national and global responsibilities. We're on about preparing Australia for the future. You're about burying Australia in the past. On the pricing of carbon, we should look to the Leader of the Opposition's multiple statements on his commitment to an emissions trading scheme, a tax at various stages. There's so many positions silent. that he'd make the Kama Sutra redundant. And Mr Speaker, 
on the question raised by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, multiple jurisdictions around the world have different forms of carbon pricing, and she should look at those juris jurisdictions to examine, examine each of the differences. And I could say to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, we are on about putting a price on carbon. Get with the international project. I now give the call to the I, I, I would think the remark made by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was unnecessary. I've got all day to sit here to wait until the House is quiet before I give the call to the member for Karangamite. And now the House is quiet. The member for Karangamite has the call. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy. Uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the Australia's strong economic performance in difficult global uh, environment, uh, as well as uh, the importance of putting in place reforms to support jobs and growth? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, thank you. I, I do thank the member for his very important question, Mr Speaker, because today the Independent Reserve Bank left the official cash rate on hold. Mr. Speaker. This follows cuts to the cash rate of 25 basis points in both November and December. And in doing this today, the Reserve Bank has struck a balance between global uncertainty on the one hand and Australia's strong economic fundamentals on the other. Mr. Speaker. Now, we understand that families are doing it tough, Mr. Speaker, but mortgage rates are significantly below the level that we inherited from those opposite. If you've got a $300,000 mortgage at the moment and you're paying the standard variable rate, you are paying $3,000 a year less than was paid under the coalition, Mr Speaker. And it's very important, Mr Speaker, that we have continued sound economic management which can deliver strong growth on the one hand and contained inflation on the other. And the strength of the fundamentals was pointed to today by the Reserve Bank, Mr Speaker. They talked about the fact that China is still robust. They talked about the challenging conditions in Europe, although they've got a little better. But they are pointing to the fact that domestic growth is strong. And we're expecting through this year trend growth of three and a quarter per cent. Trend growth which supports job creation in this country, which has seen 700,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, created in Australia over the past four years. But of course, a balance is to be struck. And as the Reserve Bank has said today, should demand conditions weaken materially, the inflation outlook would provide scope for easier monetary policy. Because the Reserve Bank is acutely aware of the challenges to our economy from the global situation. But thankfully here, we have unemployment at 5.2 per cent, half what we see today in Europe. And we are building on the strengths of our economy. And fundamental to that strength, Mr Speaker, is our determination to deliver a surplus in 2012-13. And we've seen the slapstick farce of those opposite today on the question of surplus, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the finance spokesman was out there running away from a surplus at 100 million miles an hour. The deputy leader joined him. And then, of course, we had the farce on television last night of the shadow treasurer, Mr uh, Speaker. Order. The treasurer will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. The question didn't allow for any uh, of uh, this indirect uh, attack on the opposition from the Treasurer, and I would ask you to tell the Treasurer to be directly relevant to the question. Uh, it wasn't asking about the, the opposition's position. The member will position. resume his seat. The Treasurer will return to the question. Most certainly, Mr Speaker, because we on this side of the House are determined to deliver a surplus because it goes to the very fundamentals of our economic well-being, Mr Speaker. But last night we saw on Q&A the biggest political belly flop in a long time, Mr Speaker, from the shadow treasurer, out there denying that he had said there was a uh, $70 billion dollar crater the member in their budget bottom Sturt line. will resume his seat. Has the treasurer finished? 
No, I haven't. No? Well, what is this different point of order? Well, Mr Speaker, the first point of order was on direct relevance. This one is to point out to you that he is defying your ruling. I think I am the best observer of whether someone is defying my ruling or not. I call the Treasurer. Yes, Mr Speaker, I was talking about the strength of our economic fundamentals. Mr Speaker, we have the AAA credit rating, the sovereign AAA gold-plated credit rating from the three major global credit rating agencies for the first time in our history, Mr Speaker. And it wasn't something that was ever achieved by those on that side of the House who go around the place talking our economy down, down every day of the week. And Mr Speaker, we are determined to deliver tax reform to keep our economy strong. Those on that side of the House want to give a tax cut to Gina Reinhart and Clive Palmer, and they want to stop a tax cut, Mr Speaker, to 2.7 million small businesses around our country. To keep our economy strong, we need good budget policy, we need tax reform, and we need people who are serious, Mr Speaker, about good economic policy. What we've got on the other side is simply a rabbit. Uh, the the, the member for North Sydney will resume his seat. Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It being past 3.30, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The, the honourable member for North Sydney will position. resume his seat. The honourable member for North Sydney will resume. The honourable member for North Sydney will remove himself from the House under Standing Order 94A.